Hello and welcome to episode 142. It's been a while since I recorded, so I hope I'm not too rusty. But it's a pleasure today to be joined by Sadie Shore Parks. And here's a little bit about Sadie. She teaches writing at Shepherd University, where she's the director for the Society for Creative Writing. She is author of Honey Month, which is from Main Street Rag. That'll be the, the main thrust of our conversation today. Her writing has previously appeared or is forthcoming in Appalachia. Oh, we'll talk about the, 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 the uh, pronunciation of that word in a minute, but <laughs> Appalachian Heritage, Aquifer, the Florida Review, Blue Line, Simmerin Review, the Hong Kong Review, Lines and Stars, Painted Bride Quarterly, Sierra Nevada Review, Southwest Review, Utney Reader, and Witness, among others. Her book reviews can be found in Los Angeles Review of Books and Southern Literary Review. She edited Becoming International, Musings on Studying Abroad in America, which came out through Parlor Press. Hello and good afternoon. I guess it's evening for you. That is yeah, 22. it's eight o'clock here, actually. <laughs> well, thank you for staying up late. I appreciate oh, I'm it. I'm happy to. <laughs> how are you doing today and how did I do on the bio? Anything you'd like to add? No, the bio is perfect, and I'm doing really good today. Had a nice weekend, and I, um, I'm back to teaching on Monday at Shepherd. So, <laughs> okay. So, what kind? What classes are you teaching this term? So, I'm teaching the uh, writing and rhetoric, which is the English 101 class, okay. which is actually my favorite class to teach. That, and I teach creative writing sometimes too, but mostly that 101 class. And we're doing peer review tomorrow, so that'll be fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> now, is that like is that like workshop like hardcore like everyone reads your work and, and comes in ready like is that what you're talking about so I wish we could do it a bit like workshop and I think I approach it that way a bit but it's like them exchanging papers on their okay. personal narratives and then they give each other notes um then we talk about like how it goes I don't know peer review is really hard in college you know so <laughs> uh, oh I love the personal narrative I would I would always I, I'm not teaching English this year I've you know most years I've taught it I'm just doing Spanish this year but like with my high school students, I love teaching at first. You get to know them so yeah. well, right? That's it. I signed it as my first paper too for that same reason. Yep. And then you're just like, whoa, they all have very full lives. That right. it just is a nice reminder, you know. Yeah. You do get to know them really well. Do you give them like do you give them a pretty open-ended prompt? Is it just like any formative, you know, transformational or like I mean, what what's yeah. kind of like the the prompt? So for the personal narrative, they can just write about any moment in their life. It should happen at least a year ago. So there's uh -huh. time to reflect on it. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, you can, I remember one, you can, uh, one time I told them, like, just tell me about a time you communicated well. And they really use it to tell some pretty astounding life stories that happened mm -hmm. to them, almost regardless of the prompt. Right. So I think they're kind of waiting to like get some things off their chest. And uh -huh. then, you know, the first time you're like, oh, will you tell me? And then. A lot comes out. Yes, I still I still think of some that I've read. I, I remember one of the students. I probably had her like at least ten years ago, and I still remember her personal narrative. You know what I mean? Like there's some that just stick with. You. Oh yeah, and some of their insights really stick with me too. I had a student talk about how your identity is like a foundation you build on, not a cage you stay in, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> okay. I I'm know. I, it's <laughs> truly still shapes how I view identity. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to edit that part out on the recording. I'm going to use that in one of my, yeah. I never existed, never existed. Yeah. Right? Well, I, I feel like I'm, so smart. I feel like I'm in good company because I, I like, you know, the idea that you talk about, like it, it has to be more than a year away. Yeah. For perspective. I, I, I tell them something similar. So yeah, it's with true. Skill instead of saying that, that I'm, I'm in good company. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's, I think the nice tension, especially in any sort of memoir work the eye that is seeing the event as it happens versus mm -hmm. the eye that's reflecting on it and how the more different those are, I think the better the story is both in personal narratives and poetry and kind right. of all art forms. But that's like a nice tension to develop for sure. Well, I want to, I want to come back to that. When we talk about honey month, I have, I have some questions about like perspective and mm -hmm. looking back. So that's, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd love to know a lot of the, the podcast ethos is about like the, the foundations of, of reading and writing and just, you know, pure love of, of literature and poetry and fiction and nonfiction and just art. Mm -hmm. I'd love to know about growing up. You said you grew up in Philly. Excuse yeah. Philadelphia. Sorry. I don't know if I can call it Philly if I'm not from there. You definitely oh, can. Thank you. And thank should. You. <laughs> no, and should. Uh, growing up in Philly and just, um, you know, what were you reading? Like, was it a print rich environment? Were you yeah, yeah. poetry right away? And just, I guess, just how art played into your childhood as well. So even before I moved to Philly, I grew up for a couple, like for my first six years in Pittsburgh. And my parents were both grad students in the English department at okay. University of Pittsburgh. So there was lots of books and reading in the house. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And we also lived for a couple of years with this really amazing poet, um, Lubomir Nikola from Bulgaria, who has a bunch of collections out. Mm. So I, you know, poetry was all around when I was growing up. And I always, I swear, even when I was really young, I was like, I'm going to be a poet when I grow wow. up. I sort of always really liked it and thought it seemed fun. Um, and then in high school, I read so much, way more than I can even imagine reading now. I don't know if you're the same way. <laughs> yes, yes. But in high school, I feel like I could stay up all night reading. And I was yes. just like, book after book. And now, I don't know, now I, it's a lot harder to do that. But I read a lot of poetry in high school. Um, I had this one book that was, I think it was like a thousand immortal poems of the English language that mm. I, I think I basically had memorized by the wow. end of high school. I was reading it so much. And then I really loved E.E. E. Cummings a okay. lot in high school, Allen Ginsberg. And then I had this anthology, Bum Rush the Page, um, that I read all the time, yeah. too. That's like spoken word. Yes. Poetry. Yeah. So I really love that. I still love that. Right. Um, and then I liked the beat next a ton, too, when I was in high school. Like Allen Ginsberg okay. was one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, and I wrote a lot of bad poetry myself in high school, too. <laughs> <laughs> so that was also good. Do you still have any of that bad poetry? I do. I found some recently and it was so much worse than I remembered. Oh, no. so, you know, normally you look back and you're like, hey, there was like some promise there. Um, but yeah, no, it wasn't. It was a lot of like, uh, I don't know, like I, I can look back and say that wasn't true what I was saying. I wasn't feeling that way at the time I wrote this. Oh. Like, so it's kind of weird. I'm not sure why I would lie in my own poetry or diary, like whatever back then, but <laughs> <laughs> so like it was like an affectation to like kind of were you trying to like emulate yeah. that, what you read or yeah I think I was trying to emulate what I read and what I thought maybe I should how I should be responding to stuff okay. so they were maybe sadder than I actually were uh was feeling <laughs> stuff like that or like you know just like I talk a lot about like being in the city and like trying to seem so cool uh, I look back uh, at them and I'm like I was really trying to seem very cool in these and yeah <laughs> oh man well, um, in one of the poems, and it, you know, it goes to the idea too of like the whole speaker as poet, poet as speaker. Yeah. You know, you can play the fifth if you want. You can say <laughs> yes, that's me, hundred percent, or that's an exaggerated version of me. But one of the, in one of the, some of the the lyrics, some of the 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 phrasing from your your poem is the following quote: "She showed me." She referring to mom. Yeah. She showed me the art in my cluster of scraps. So yeah. I wonder, like, about art like visual art, you have the, the, you know, beautiful painting in back of your paintings. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Like, are you a, are you a visual artist? You, have you been, is that a muse for you? <laughs> so I studied art history in undergrad and I really like doing like painting and calligraphy um, and all of that. My husband's much more of the visual artist, though. He's a really gifted uh, painter and that's definitely his medium. Okay. Um, but yeah, I really do love, uh, doing any type of art that line in particular I think about um like what my mom was sort of how she was like encouraging me to see myself in like the best light maybe and how Mm. my childhood and her childhood were pretty different um even growing up just those first couple years in Pittsburgh and uh how much she sort of like gave to me intellectually in a way okay when I was growing up and sort of set me up in that way um but I mean that's that poem's also a lot about the influence that like families have on the way you see yourself the way you have like your body image right um and class and like a lot of stuff Uh yeah that's I'm happy you pulled that line out because that's one of my um favorite poems in the collection oh it is remind me the name of that one I think it's called, wow, I should really know this. <laughs> no, it, it, you have a lot of them. I don't, I don't, I don't blame Yeah, you. I think it's called, um, wow, how can I not think of it? Let me look really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Craze Counted Carefully, of course. That's why it's called Craze oh, okay. Counted Carefully. Okay. And it's on um, a flip poem. So like the first half of the poem is written in one form and then the lines right. are yeah. repeated, but with the syntax reversed. Yes. So it's kind of it's supposed to be at like mother and daughter, kind of that mirror going on. Right. Yeah, it's one yeah, of, I, mean, I learned that's one of my favorite, um, like not prompts, but forms for writing poems. So, OK, yeah, no, that definitely comes through in the collection. And, you know, I really enjoyed the I mean, even just that one line we're talking about the the scraps. You know, I read that as the the scraps from the speaker 
but the way you explain it, it's almost like they could be those scraps from mom too, you know, from the previous. Yeah. Generation. Yeah. And I think scraps is very much, I always think of like leftover things, mm -hmm. actually, especially in grad school, a lot of the art that I was making, um, I feel like was just from like leftover, like cardboard or like literal okay. trash. Oh. One of my first essays I published was about um, this robot I made called Sadie Bot. Yeah. And I made from like a bunch of like old clothes and boxes and stuff. And I mean, that's used to be, I think, how I made every everything. And this idea of like, it feels better to make a piece of art when you've repurposed it from something mm -hmm. that was very worthless. Right. Um, even with uh, negative experiences, like if you can turn that into a poem, there's something very good about that. Okay. Um, kind of like an alchemy effect that's, I think, really rewarding. Um, and I think in visual arts, especially, I tend to, I don't know, waste materials. <laughs> uh, so I end up uh, kind of repurposing some stuff. And I just like, I like how that looks too. Right. So, you, so no, so, so Sadie Bot, no other name. No, you didn't want to like no. a dream name of Sadie Bot. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's funny. I feel like I named, especially when I was younger, whenever I got the chance to name something, I was like, um, Sadie. <laughs> because I don't know, I think it's a good name. I almost named my daughter Sadie, actually. Oh, wow. But I didn't at the last minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I guess you could always change that. or in, in, I could. She would have been a good Sadie, her. but she's uh, Esther now. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful name. Oh, thank you. Speaking of beauty, like my transition there. The, <laughs> the beauty of language, you know, is obviously such a part of poetry and you have so many beautiful phrases and lines and you know syntax and just usage I wonder you know now back then in college high school who are some of the writers who really you know give you chills at will that we talk about through this podcast like yeah. those those lines that you can quote it quote oh it gosh. will those lines that you can you know it doesn't necessarily mean you have to literally quote it quote them word for word but just like yeah. that you could summon forth right now if you want you know what I mean oh yeah I mean there's a couple and it's funny it's like you don't pick the poems that have that effect on you mm -hmm. sometimes they're not even by your favorite authors it's just like you read it and you almost have to like set the book down because you're like yes. oh, God, it's so good so one poem that is stuck in my mind right now I just can't shake it is this poem by Warren Shire women who are for women who are difficult to love mm -hmm. I almost had to pull over my car the other day to read it on my phone because I was like craving reading it so bad Oh. I mean, it's just a fantastic poem. She's a really great writer in general. Um, and then Marianne Baruch is a poet that I think has a way with words that tricks you into thinking it's going to be so casual and breezy. Sure. And then there's this core underneath that just like stings you and it's so powerful and mm. I'm really impressed by her. And then my forever poet, like the poet that I could, my desert island poet would be mm -hmm. Louise Glock. Okay. And um you know, at the end of my suffering, there was a door is such an amazing line and everything. I mean, every truly almost every poem she's written is just right. breathtaking. Uh, so I don't know who my favorite is. And then there's still some like E. Cummings poems from high school mm -hmm. that just have stuck with me from then. Um, but I would say right now, I mostly read a lot of a uh, contemporary poetry that's just like out in the lit journals okay. so some of my favorite poems I don't even know if I could recall the poet's name off sure. the top of my head even though their lines are like seared in my brain mm -hmm. as weird as that sounds no I hear you that makes a lot of sense Louise, Louise Glug got her got her Nobel right she did so, so well deserved that was such a great choice mm -hmm. um and then uh, Ada Lamont just became yes. the poet laureate, which is another where I was like, yes. great choice. That was such an exciting, like, that's probably who I would have picked. So that was really mm. exciting when that happened too. And she's another poet who just knocks it out of the park every time. Andrea Cohen um, okay. is another great one. The Committee Weighs In, I think is the title of yeah. the really famous oh, one. Oh, I was just thinking right? about that one the other day. Is that the From one Three that's Penny the five Review. or six line? Yeah. That's the one where they... She pretends her mother's alive. Yeah, oh. I pretend I won the Nobel and she pretends she's not dead. I mean, you know, it's interesting. Lately, the only thing I want to read are uh, short stories with like twist endings, almost mm -hmm. like sci-fi ones. And I've noticed as I was revising my newest uh, bit of poetry that it's creeping in to my poetry. And I'm wanting these little twists uh, at the yeah. end. Yes. And I'm wondering if I should edit those out or not. But um <laughs> <laughs> like like O. Henry poetry kind of thing. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, 
Well, well, we, maybe we can make a trade. Could you could you give me like um, I saw Ada Limon when she was named poet laureate. I'd see like just online like love people love her. I mean, she seemed like she's, she's such so a great amazing. global you know poetry citizen or whatever you want to say. Yeah, she's so well deserved. What would be like a good place to start? Like a good one or two hmm. of hers. So I would say, depending on what you've read already, the hurting kind is her most recent one and is very very good. So is the carrying. One of my favorite poems about her, I can't remember the title now, but it's about horses and it's very, it's like about a, about grief. Um, mm. That's really powerful, man. And then there's another one she has that's so good. That I also can't remember the title of that's like, how did I not see the blessing in this the whole time? That's about um, like the parents, okay. but uh, I'm just kind of selling it short. It's really powerful when you read it. Okay. That's, that's a good start. Yeah, um, that's where I would start, I think. I mean, yeah. you can't go wrong with either of those books. So. Right. You were talking about the uh, the twist endings, and it's it's not it's not sci-fi, but I, I'm going to recommend to you, maybe you've read it, it's, um, it's Borges. Yeah. Uh, Jorge Luis Borges. And it's called The Gospel According to Mark. Oh, so I, it's so funny. I have a tab open on my computer right now from one of his short stories with a there twist ending. It's the one about the senator. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I know yeah, so it. what's I his... The book of Mark, it's, it's called? called. It's called the Gospel According to Mark, and I think the Gospel According to Mark. I think if you Google it, I think it'll come up as. I think you can still free. You can read the New York when it was in the New Yorker back in the seventies or whatever. So this That's is fun. such a treat. I feel like I've been exhausting all of these short stories with twist endings. So I'm very yeah. happy to have this no, new this recommendation. Is- that, that, that's one where you kind of like at the end you're like oh, oh that's the best you know. and it's funny you can read it knowing there's going to be a twist ending and still it, right. it changes the way you approach it but it still like works I don't know right. I'm right. I'm really liking them these days I, I would have my students I was I was introduced to to Shirley Jackson's The Lottery by a colleague oh, yeah I hadn't read it till like three years ago or something yeah and, and you know obviously a whoa that's and, you know, a twist. <laughs> yeah. once, once you read it for a second time, you're like, you, you know, you read it with a different, different yeah. eye and you're like, oh, wow. Oh, that the rocks and they were getting together in the circle. And, That's such a gift when a writer can write something that has a twist surprise, but still rewards a rereading of it. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because you just notice more about it. It feels more well-deserved. Right. Um, I'm so impressed when people are able to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, with, with creating, like, were you, were you able to get into, um, like, did you do grad school for creative writing? Um, and I guess just about like any Eureka moments or, or a moment where you're Mm -hmm. like, I can do this. I've been doing this for a long time. You said with poetry, but like people, people enjoy it. It resonates with them. Like I can do Mm -hmm. this for a living or I, I want to do this or anything like that. So grad school was a really great time for writing because, you know, everyone in my cohort was doing creative writing. You have a lot of free time. So I could live, I feel like really indulge in living kind of like creatively and artistically. And it was really dreamy in that way. And I think something I'm always still kind of trying to recreate in my life, that feeling of like, all I have to do right now is like art and like that will be a good day and that will be like productive and that will be how I contribute to society And I think that's kind of a hard thing to negotiate sometimes because you don't want to be too self-indulgent and do something that isn't helping people um, and too inward looking, you know, that isn't necessarily a good life. But I think, uh, you know, as I've kind of been able to negotiate that and figure out how my writing and my teaching can be like helpful to other people, that's been really nice. And um, I think one of the moments where I was like, I can really do this. Um, Well, one was after my book already came out, I got to do a reading in Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, my hometown. So that was really nice. And there was like a really big crowd and it just felt so good. Every, you know, it was a really nice, like responsive crowd. And I was like, all right, like Mm -hmm. this is happening. And um, a bunch of the poems take place in Philly. So like walking around that felt really good. Um, Another time I felt really like I can do this is uh, when we were moving into where I live now and I got like all the journals I'd been in to move. And I was like, okay, this is like a lot. This is heavy. Like I have made some progress. Sometimes you have a big goal. You forget that progress is being made that like you're already doing it. You started like steps have been taken because you just think like, I want to have this certain thing. Um, 
And I think also, yeah, I don't know. I think that it's also maybe like the only job that I would really be good at is like teaching and doing poetry. Every other job I have had very not good success with, um, like working in retail. Actually, I got in trouble for writing poems on the back of the receipts and stuff. Then when I stocked shelves, Um, I was just like working on poems in my head the whole time and that job didn't work out great. Um, But with like teaching and writing, I feel like I can do it. It's just once I have to leave that, I'm a lot less successful. Yeah, you are where you're meant to be, right? That's a great, that's a much more positive way to look at it. Yeah, I found my little spot in the world and it's been working out nice and yeah. And there's nothing like the, 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 the hard copies of those journals, right? Oh my gosh, there really isn't. Even though I, this is something I go back and forth on because what I read is almost entirely online print journals. I think I read more on my phone sure. than anything because that's like how I encounter it. So sometimes when I publish something in print, I feel like it's gone forever. Mm-hmm. Like if it's not also online. One of my favorite things I've written was the essay called Growl that was in Simran Review. But it, since it's not also online, I almost, I almost feel like no one's ever going to be able to read it if they don't subscribe or they don't get a copy from the library. Sure. So um. I'm very partial to online publications. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. That's what I read a ton. Yeah. So. Well, so Honey Month is the one that is the most recent um, collection. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to paraphrase too much or I don't want to put words in your mouth too much, but it it is based on uh, like the honeymoon month, I guess. Yeah. The idea of like um, the cicadas, I was going to say cicadas, but cicadas, right? (laughs) cicadas right and there was a there was a plague a biblical plague now but i just like to know what you know just the seeds for the book you know i guess that goes yeah. in with the significance of the title so i had that summer off because of how my teaching schedule was in grad school okay and we i actually had got we kind of like eloped in the winter but we were doing our honeymoon and doing a lot of traveling um we were calling it like our honey month in the summer <laughs> and i was writing a ton during that time and it happened that the cicada plague hit West Virginia at the same time. So, you know, mm. everything was just like coated in cicadas and there was this like sound everywhere. And it Whoa. felt like a moment, like, hmm. oh, this is like my honeymoon month is going on and there's a cicada plague. And like, you know, we were getting ready to move and stuff like that. And looking back, it's funny because this was the summer of 2016. Okay. And I just see online, a lot of people are like, that was the best summer like ever. Um, so I think it was a like a lot of people experienced that summer as being something. But um, I think, you know, so cicadas spent 17 years underground and then they come up, uh, they all mate and eat and they basically like all die. And I was it really makes you think about uh, or for me, it made me think about how long things kind of stay under the surface mm. and then when they're ready to be made sense of, they can kind of come out and do something. Um, but then they're done. You don't, you know, the cicada doesn't go back underground. You don't need to live in this moment forever, but it should come up at one point and be processed and then, <laughs> then can be gone. So I found, I mean, yeah. I could, cicadas are very interesting, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, and I guess, so the, to me, the whole, the way they just change the sound, the look of the environment all at once, that they all knew to come up at the same time. I was just like very taken by it. Right. Um, so I sat on my porch and wrote a lot of poems while listening to them. And oh man. So um, you know, the great Gabby Bates, she was a she was a guest on on the, the podcast earlier. Um, she had a great, a loving review of your work. Oh, and, oh. right. That made me so happy because I'm such a fan of hers. Yes. Oh my gosh, I was so honored, honestly. Well, I'll make sure it included in the episode notes. Um, I think it's pretty recent, right? Yeah, it came out in late August. So I got it talk with her a lot this summer when she was in Rome like leading up to going to Rome so I mean she's very she's very inspiring so that was really exciting for me yeah I'm not I'm not um you know again I'm kind of paraphrasing but she was she was talking about some one of the the poems said the girl to the mirror yeah and it was something that you know basically like it's this idea of like the face like looking in the mirror getting in the way of other things that you could see and just ideas yeah. of you know, perspective, right? Like the, the face in the mirror is right there, right in front of you. Um, I was, I'm, I'm thinking of like, um, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a hackneyed, you know, hackneyed complaint now, but this idea that like, you're at some beautiful event, you're at your kid's recital, or you're at a concert and everyone's taking a video of it. Yeah. 
right? You're not experiencing in the moment. And again, I'm not the first yeah. to say that, but I guess I'm just, um, I'm just wondering about, I guess that's how we get into perspective here. This idea of, um, you know, 2016 wasn't that long ago, but it's long enough for perspective mm -hmm. and just about how you were able to capture something that was so visceral, right? Like the, yeah. the cicadas, like literally, you know, you said to making the sounds, how are you able to capture that when you write about it, even if it's a month later, two months later, like how are you able to get into that mindset, I guess? That's a really good question. It's actually something I was just talking about my students with too, because when you write about something sad, say for like a personal narrative, mm -hmm. you're right back in that moment. It's very emotionally taxing because, you know, you're sad again because you're thinking about it. Even if you're reprocessing it mm -hmm. into something nice, it's still unpleasant. Um, and it's hard to go back and revisit things and yeah. see them in a new light. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm kind of going to go with that classic, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader, mm -hmm. where you have to be really open to, to reimagining past events and understanding them in new ways, mm -hmm. um, if you're going to write about them. So you can't pick something that's too precious to you where you won't, you're not willing, there's no wiggle room to how you see it. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, it was, so with the girl with the mirror poem where you know, trying to look out the window because of the way light works with on tr transportation. Mm -hmm. Even though you're facing forward, you're seeing your own reflection. It's fogging what you're actually yes. able to process and see. And just no matter what you're trying to look at, you're seeing yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that can be nice in poetry, that it's all sort of a self-portrait. But I think uh, some of the really great poets are able to somehow like mm -hmm. remove themselves and give us this new right. give themselves a new look at the scenery and at themselves and it's really I really admire poets who are able to do that um yeah writing about something that happened in the past is weird huh. um that makes sense thank you yeah um I like the the transportation and the seeing yourself in the mirror that that idea really yeah. resonates there for sure yeah yeah I thought it was uh I think it was on, on your Goodreads page for this it was it was a very short review, but I'm like, yep, nailed it. Uh, <laughs> quote, there is an ease to Shore Park's writing voice that I appreciate. Oh, yeah, I actually remember that review. That one I liked. Yeah, that was really nice. That that comes through so much. It's just, you know, I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure you didn't have a, you know, mm -hmm. Gabriel Garcia Marquez moment where you spoke, you supposedly <laughs> wrote, wrote uh, Hundreds of Solitude in like 24 hours, or, you know. Yeah. Like, like, I'm sure you didn't. This was not just flowing, flowing, flowing all the time. Yeah, it, it, definitely it not. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but ease, ease is the word. And I mean, these as total compliments, like you're, it's a slow, it's slow poetry. You know, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's something where it, it's a quiet poetry, I think is a better way to say it. There's, I really like that description a lot. Right? Yeah. There's not a lot of explosions and crazy off the wall moments and chaos. But yeah. there's definitely a lot of emotion involved. There's definitely a lot of passion, but it's just well, it's just a, it's just a quiet poetry. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say I think that a lot of times poetry is the opposite of drama, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's taking these small moments and making them even quieter and smaller and more like approachable in a way. Sure. Um, and so I think that's something that's really important to me. And it's funny. So I do think that I when I would edit my poetry, I wanted them to feel easy and conversational. Mm -hmm. I'm a big, like I was saying with Marianne Baruch, the breeziness in her work or Frank O'Hare, I think does this really well too. It's something I really admire. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I'm glad that that is also how you saw it because it's something that I, I admire in um, other people's poetry. Right. It's, and then I also though really like sort of the 16th, 17th century poetry that's just like, almost just like spitting game. Like there's like, come live with me and be my love. And like, so then there's that funny, like I always feel like there's some moments of that in my writing too. Um, and I think those can work because the rest can be more conversational. Right. I also was a young woman when I wrote this and I wanted it to sound like how I talked and like, like a young woman. I remember, yeah. especially the bad poetry that I talked about myself writing earlier. I thought I needed to sound like an old white man from like the 18th century for it to be poetic and be something anyone would want to read. Sure. And the more I shed that and the more I just wrote like my actual age and gender and self and 
how I would talk, um, the truer my poetry kind of became and the more positive feedback I got on it, honestly. Right. Well, so when you're talking about like 16th century, is that like, um, uh, what's the famous poem? Like, do not go gently into the good night. Is that oh yeah. So I don't know when he wrote that. I don't know when Dylan Thomas wrote that. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I think of that. like, uh, I, I would, so I would talked about the, um, what's it called? The, like the pastoral poetry had a okay. huge impact on me. Um, and then like Merlot and uh, like Shakespeare. Oh, John Donne, absolutely. John Donne, right. Just yeah. rocks my world. Like, yeah. I just love, he is a chills at Wells poet for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just like absolutely takes my breath away. Right. Um, and that's funny. I feel like I go, I have an anthology of 16th, 17th century poetry that I really love, even though in many ways it couldn't be more different than the other things I read and like my yeah. own writing. Was um so I so I guess so I guess I was I was wrong on it. I was opposite. So you you were saying basically like that spitting game, like that was like lacking subtlety. It was, but it was yeah. also just so apparent and like what it was trying to do. And it's love sure. coach. It's like come live with me. And like there's right. a line in my book where it's like if the stars ever do collude, then truly we were their work or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like just that whole thing of like the heavens want us to be together yeah. like my beauty like you know <laughs> like um, what the, she walks today. in and all the best of dark and light meet in her aspect and her eyes like that's Whoa. so gorgeous Whoa. but it's so flirtatious at the same time yeah. so I really like it <laughs> like our students would say bars yeah absolutely bars. Absolutely. Absolutely. absolutely bars <laughs> absolute bars absolutely